The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life. It's the show with a hot questions and even hotter wigs. Wait, that's incorrect. <laughs> it's uh it's a pro wrestling podcast. Uh it's episode 362. I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam. We have so much to talk about today and uh it's none of it's pleasant. <laughs> yeah, so so many things if I may do a an inappropriate riff on our normal intro. So many things I wish we didn't have to talk about uh, on here, the uh, first and only wrestling podcast. Uh, Oh boy. Yeah. Uh, So Vince McMahon, the executive chairman of TKO group was accused in a new lawsuit from an old accuser who uh, has gone public for the first time. Um, was accused of sex trafficking, sexual assault, physical battery. Um, and not paying an NDA that he agreed to. Um, and uh, in a lawsuit that. Also names John Laurinaitis, WWE's being sued, John Laurinaitis and Vincent Wander being sued, and uh, as collateral damage in there, uh, Brock Lesnar is named uh, in the suit as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh boy, there's a, a 67-page uh, court filing regarding this new lawsuit that's available online that I uh, don't recommend reading. If you ever want to sleep again, uh, yeah, I uh, I only read excerpts. That this story all kind of broke while I was uh, working my my day job, but uh, obviously I read the full article, but didn't get to uh, read the full lawsuit. There are there are screen grabs of text messages. There are very detailed accounts of um, uh, many different types of crimes. <laughs> uh horrific uh crimes being conducted by Vince McMahon by and by John Laurinaitis and by and there are uh, many other unnamed WWE officials and stars and uh workers who are also uh mentioned though not by name so this is a widespread systemic issue within this company i think it's fair to say based on this or it certainly appears to be um a lot of people working very hard to on the front end of this as far as bringing this woman into vince's web and tangling her in it and then on the other end doing everything they can to make sure that this didn't see the light of day. Uh, and uh, I hate to say, thankfully, I think it's a net good that this came out as far as if you're hoping for the tiniest shred of possibility that any of the people involved will face any consequences. This is the best chance we've gotten of that so far. But uh, that's that's about the only uh, silver lining I could think of in what is a a very dark cloud of what just feels like the absolute worst of of pro wrestling, of the entertainment industry, of corporate America, the way that systems of people in power utilize the systems around them to keep themselves in power and to, uh, for lack of a better term, ruin the lives of people around them uh, simply because they can and because there are systems in place to protect these powerful people from ever facing any consequences. It's a really, really huge story. And it's also just a huge bummer. (laughs) I know that's really, that's a silly oversimplification of it, but it's like, it's a, it's a horrific feeling. I don't know how you could read this and not just feel 
feel bad about the human condition, feel bad about the world when you read this and see what was allowed to go on, how many people had to have known some part of this and let it happen or participated in it. It's just, it's just horrific. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what more that uh, two, uh, two geeks of the wrestling podcast can yeah. add as far as the discourse regarding this. I think you did a nice job there. Um, these alleged crimes of um, physical and emotional abuse, sexual assault, sex trafficking. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it is the ultimate. Uh, with what we know of Vince McMahon's um, character. Mm. None of this would have happened. None of this would have come out today if he had just paid the three million dollars he agreed to pay. Seems he like it. He just stopped paying. <laughs> it's it's really mind boggling, and yet uh, it's why the company had to change its name twenty two years ago mm-hmm. because he uh, he, the, he was uh, just told you can't call yourselves the WWF in the UK, and he continued. He agreed to it, and then he uh, just kept doing what he wanted to anyway and uh did change the name of the company anyway it's horrible there's a 67 page lawsuit um on courtlistener.com uh all the trigger warnings all of the uh graphic details are there um it's horrible and um i guess maybe worth pointing out i don't know that the lawsuit names Lesnar specifically, it just calls him a WWE superstar and former UFC heavyweight champion. And it was the uh, Wall Street Journal who uh, connected those dots. Correct. They're not very hard dots to connect, by the way. And like, uh, this. and he, uh, I don't think they were negotiating with Kane Velasquez to come back in 2021. And then he, uh, he, a snowstorm kept him from traveling. It's like, mm. well, it's, it's we know this. Yeah. Uh Johnny Ace um goes down in this uh w- Johnny Ace is named in this. I uh, I I don't know. I don't know where, where to go here. The, the McMahon and the and the uh the person uh filing the plaintiff filing filing the lawsuit here uh were introduced by the building manager at the condo where do they live? Mm-hmm. Where they lived? And uh, McMahon roomed her, and there you go. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things, and this would all, of course, be alleged and speculation. <laughs> but the way that it is described is so textbook that it would be very hard to believe that this is <laughs> this is the only time that Vince McMahon employed those tactics. Uh, with a with a woman um, as far as finding someone who was in emotional and financial distress immediately making her financially and professionally dependent on him before demanding physical favors from her to keep her in that position um, it's it's pretty textbook it's pretty textbook for how this uh this sort of situation happens all too often and it's and that's not to say there's always a certain type of guy on who wants to fire off a take of like oh you're surprised oh you're surprised by this you're you're very smart you're very smart no it's having this all laid out in such excruciating detail uh is is the shocking and jarring part and seeing the list of names, not just, as you said, Vince and Laurinaitis are the individuals named in the lawsuit, along with the company. Wall Street Journal named Brock Lesnar as another figure. There's plenty of other, as we said, unnamed WWE officials and, and stars named in the lawsuit. Or not named, I should say. 
uh, intimated that there there were other people with knowledge of the situation. Um, so it's just, uh, yeah, it's I just keep coming back to the word horrific, and it is uh, it is incumbent. <laughs> Uh, it, it is the system is working as intended, I guess, is what I would say as far as, like I said, how these uh, companies tend to work. It's not a it's not a secret. I'm not the first person to ever say it. You know, HRs and legal departments really aren't your friends. <laughs> They're there to protect the company and to, you know, limit the potential public or private damage that could be caused by the incident. Uh, to the company, not to the individual who uh, was, in this case, uh, alleged to have been victimized by it all. So it's uh, it's terrible. It's an indictment of our entire <laughs> of our entire corporate system in this country and the world, perhaps. And uh, it's it's uh, it's it's that's it. That's I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yep. So. As as outlined, it's ju- it's just Vince WWE and John Laurinaitis that are being sued, but there mm-hmm. are um four parties referred to as WWE corporate officers number one through four, mm-hmm. and a WWE superstar who is uh, alleged to be Brock Lesnar. Who are uh, who are also in this lawsuit? So mm-hmm. everyone's going to play guessing games about who the four people are. I I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, a TKO basically gave a statement said that all happened before we got here. <laughs> yeah, they gave a very yeah, not con- not convincing uh, statement about it, and they're like, but this is horrific. And uh, and we're all, but we're handling it internally, but it's terrible. Mm-hmm. But we're handling it internally. Um, Vince McMahon's uh, spokesperson responded with uh, this quote: um, "This lawsuit is replete with lies, obscene, made-up instances that never occurred, and a vindictive distortion of the truth." vigorously defend himself well there you go yeah um there's also some allegations made by the the victim's lawyers about the original investigation conducted by the then wwe board in there called it a sham said that it was made clear that she would talk to investigators and she was not contacted um so Look, we all we've all talked. To, we all know the palace intrigue that took place. Stephanie leaves the company, then Vince retires, quote unquote. Stephanie comes back suddenly to run the company for a while. Then Vince, there's a vote from the board of whether or not Vince should come back. The board votes no, so Vince McMahon fires the board, takes back his seat by force. And his daughter leaves the company again, this time for good. Uh, Obviously, there are people who knew he was a liability and didn't want him there. Um, Hard to imagine that people that were on the board at that time knew nothing of this scenario. Uh, So I think, say, I don't know if there was a presser coming up where one of the people who was on the board at the time of the original investigation uh, or uh, maybe maybe that person should be asked some questions about this. Like, and maybe he should only be asked questions about this. Yep. Uh, some uh, sleuths have done some sleuthing and found out that uh, corporate officer number one in the uh, in the filing. Um, there's only two individuals that. Uh, It could be based on who was on the board in 2019 and who fits the description. And those two people are Frank Riddick, who was a former CEO and an interim CFO for the company, and uh, Paul Levesque. Mm. (sighs) 
There you go. Yeah. Well, that's a horrible story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I guess that's what I just keep going back to. Uh, there's no one less equipped than the people that will be called on to ask questions if, in fact, there is still a presser event after the Royal Rumble this weekend. Um, than the people that will be called on to ask questions. But boy, wouldn't you just like it if we were surprised just this once? Yeah. Yeah, I I I don't think so. Uh anyway, uh so aside from that aside from that horrible story. Mm-hmm. Uh and the timing of this is interesting. Um Dwayne Johnson joined w- the uh, TKO board of directors this week. It's kind of the new public face of the company. I think that's a fair statement. Yep. And uh, the company announced that uh, they're going to, their WWE Raw will be going to Netflix beginning in 2025. It's an initial five year deal. And Netflix have the option to extend it to 10 or even 20 years. So. Raw is going to streaming and they're getting paid a boatload of money for it. Um, apparently $5 billion over 10 years is the, is the number. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though Netflix has the out and could extend it. Uh, the basic numbers were reported as 5 billion for 10 years. Basically uh, what's uh 66% increase over what they're getting now from a uh, USA for raw. Mm-hmm. So Dwayne Dwayne's in Dwayne's in the fold. <laughs> Dwayne is a uh, du- Dwayne's hands are on deck. He's got his glasses. He's got his turtleneck. He's got his leather jacket. He's uh, there at the New York stock exchange with Ari Emanuel and Nick Khan and Paul Levesque and Vince McMahon mm-hmm. and uh, ringing the bell and shaking hands. And he's got his glasses on. And uh, Raw's going to Netflix. Uh, any thoughts on Dwayne joining the board and uh, possibly wanting to, I don't know, wrestle Roman, but not at this year's Mania, but on Netflix at a WrestleMania? Or I, I don't know what Dwayne's plans are. But uh, thoughts on Dwayne? Thoughts on uh, Raw on Netflix? Uh, yeah, I liked uh, Dwayne's little little. He thinks he's so clever. Because he's he has the turtleneck and he's wearing the Steve Jobs glasses. Really thinks he's fooling people. Uh, uh it's Clark, he's Clark Kent. Uh huh. And his and his and his leather jacket, of course, because he's still he's salt of the earth. He drives a pickup truck. He has a farm. Um, I, like you said, he's a very charming, charismatic face to go do all of these interviews to go on CNBC to go on first take with uh, Stephen A. Smith and like, yeah, of course, if, if he's willing to do this, of course, of course, that's an easy yes for the company. And for Dwayne, he's had a little bit of a rough and tumble couple of years as far as uh, financial successes in the movie industry. And uh, this industry could probably do a little good for his, uh, you know his name value again build that back up a little bit in the uh in the corporate world as well so it's a a win-win for everyone and we got to see Dwayne in his little glasses uh on a bunch of uh a bunch of cable news shows talking about his his grandfather and his father and i'm sure i didn't watch any full clips i'm sure he worked in the 7 bucks story at some point um isn't that just wonderful? Yes, it was great to see Dwayne and Vince and Ari Emanuel and Nick Khan shaking hands and hugging after ringing the bell. It was a great, uh, great image to have. Um, I don't know, man. Like I, <laughs> I probably could have worked up some more ire about this if, like, the most horrific story in wrestling history, not involving a murder of a child, didn't come out today. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yes, it was. Uh, yeah, it's an it's an optics move. He's a he's a charming, charismatic man who will uh, do great on representing the company and 
could probably get on to any talk show he wants whenever he wants. It's, so anytime you got a big show to promote, uh, when in a couple of years when they're shopping around the network rights, there's there's a guy who can go out there and and just fly the flag for your brand that uh, that everybody everybody in the world, uh, including non wrestling fans, seems to like a lot. So yeah, makes makes sense for for everyone, I think. Um, surprised at all that it's Netflix and not uh, Amazon Prime. I mean. Basing it solely off that uh, New York fashion show where Paul and Jeff Bezos were sitting next to each other while Maxi Dupree was on the stage. <laughs> I don't know if we've mentioned that incident before on the show, but a uh, totally normal occurrence. Uh huh. Yeah, of course. Just two, just two single guys <laughs> out on the town. Uh, yeah, I, I think maybe that makes sense. And also because Netflix, I know they've done, I think they did like a couple of, they did like a live comedy special with Chris Rock and they, they've done one or two live things. But as of like last year, the CEO was still going on about, ah, we don't, we don't need live. We're, we're not interested in getting into the live sports thing. And obviously the uh, WB is not a real sport, but it is of the same sort of variety of programming as far as doing live programming from an arena. So it's doesn't, it, it wasn't the obvious fit amongst all of these different streaming choices that already do a lot of live programming and a lot of live sports and theoretically already have the infrastructure built into air a live three hour show from an arena every week. So I guess it's surprising in that way, right? Yeah, I was surprised. I was surprised that it wasn't Amazon. Um, not surprised that it was streaming. Was surprised that it wasn't Amazon. Mm. Uh, so, um, to the only thing uh, that I can speak on about this is that uh, the I think the live program that they tried before the Chris Rock special was uh, the Love is Blind finale live. Okay. And it's a program that my uh, my wife watches. <laughs> and uh, she said that uh, the stream, there was, uh, it, it crashed Netflix and it started like 36 minutes late. <laughs> so hopefully they can iron out some of those problems before uh, they have, uh, they have about a year to figure it out. Yeah, and then I guess yeah, Rome uh, and yet to your other point, Dwayne was asked multiple times about the Roman Reigns match or about wrestling, and he gave a weird non-committal answer, which would at least very would at least make you think it's not necessarily happening in two months, uh, at the very least. But who who knows? Maybe that's just their. It is also worth noting that his new position and the money he's making from it does not include a talent contract from what I could tell. So they would need to pony up additional money if they want to, if they want him in the tights, I would think. Yeah, I, I don't understand what he's talking about um, <laughs> when it comes to wrestling. Uh, it, I think he's going to wrestle again. He's clearly going to re- wrestle Roman again. It seems like he wants to wrestle Roman at something that doesn't exist, which is like a WrestleMania on Netflix in China. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, I I don't think there's going to be a WrestleMania in China in the next decade. <laughs> well, I mean, they did a, a Royal Rumble in like May in Saudi Arabia. So you could do Chinese WrestleMania in like June this year. I I guess so. I, I, I suppose, I, I, I really don't know. Yeah. <laughs> As you mentioned, it's hard to, uh, it's it's really hard to <laughs> talk about any of this. Yes. Uh, like it's just uh, another day here. But <sighs> um, the Royal Rumble is coming up this Saturday. It is uh, a couple days away, and uh, as always. I would invite everyone to participate in the Cheesecake Rumble. Which is you buy uh, two whole cheesecakes (laughs) 
and um, every time there is a an elimination, you take a bite of cheesecake. Every time there's a surprise entrant, you eat a slice of cheesecake. <laughs> and uh, every time there is a roar spot, you eat uh, two slices of cheesecake. <laughs> and then every time someone enters and someone doesn't feed uh, for the person that just came into the Royal Rumble, uh, you have to eat three slices of cheesecake. So... Uh, you're going to need at least two cheesecakes um, to play the Cheesecake Rumble, but everyone should play along. Yeah, if if nothing else good ever came out of the Wrestling Observer Figure 4 online message boards, it is the the genesis of the Cheesecake Rumble. <laughs> you know, many years ago, I uh, I brought a couple of cheesecakes to your house for a, uh, for a Royal Rumble watch party. <laughs> I legitimately had, I don't know, maybe twelve dollars in my checking account, <laughs> and uh, decided, you know what, a couple frozen Sara Lee cheesecakes, because I need to, uh, I need to participate in the cheesecake rumble. <laughs> we were not successful that year, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, I think we all had cheesecake, but we didn't, uh, we didn't necessarily follow the rules. No, because that's a lot of cheesecake. <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> oh, it sure is. Uh, yeah, so Roy Rumble's coming up. Uh, they've announced like seven dudes and uh, five ladies, I think, for the respective Rumbles. Uh, maybe eight dudes now. I don't know. Priest is in. Kofi's in. Uh, there's people listening on Wikipedia, I think, that uh, uh, WWE has not acknowledged, which is kind of bizarre. Mm-hmm. Let me take a look at the Wikipedia page here because this is uh, this is a good pod. <laughs> no, everybody on uh, everybody has been announced. Okay, so uh, they've announced eight men, and those men are Cody, CM Punk, Nakamura, Lashley, Drew McIntyre, Gunther, Kofi Kingston, Damian Priest, and the ladies announced to this point are Bailey, Nia Jax, Becky Lynch, and Bianca Belair. A lot of bees. Uh, so there you go. Uh, Roman Reigns will be defending the title against Randy Orton and AJ Styles and LA Knight in a four-way. And Logan Paul faces Kevin Owens on the show. Uh, this is a... Of all the shows the WWE's produced, this is another of them. <laughs> they obviously want you to think Cody Rhodes or CM Punk is winning the Rumble with maybe Gunther having an outside chance. And obviously, uh, Bailey, Nia Jax, Becky Lynch, or Bianca Belair is winning the Women's Rumble. And really, the only two that have been um, presented as having a chance are Bailey and Becky. So I think those are your safe bets. Bailey and Becky and uh, Cody and Punk. And whichever one doesn't win the Rumble probably wins the Elimination Chamber. Yeah, uh, there was there was a very amusing couple of days where uh, uh, what's his face, the Sports Illustrated guy who covers wrestling, Justin uh, Barrasso. Justin Barrasso uh, was was he was uh, for the first time in his career, he accidentally <laughs> printed something that WWE wanted out there to work the fans, but wasn't entirely true. Uh, this has never happened to Justin before, and he did apologize and. Uh, and uh, and and correct his error uh, the following day. But yes, there was a report that went out and on Sports Illustrated that said uh, Cody's not winning the Rumble. He's not wrestling Roman at WrestleMania. He's not winning the title. He's going to wrestle Punk, and Gunther's going to win the Rumble and wrestle Seth Rollins, and they're going to do Dwayne and The Rock. And then the next day, it was like, actually, that was all lies probably fed to a source to try to out them as a source. (laughs) And uh, so now it looks like Cody is probably winning the Rumble. So, yeah, Cody, Cody still seems like the the one to do here. Um, But I guess you could you could draw out the drama of is the company going to screw him over for another couple of weeks if you want to. But I wouldn't. 
given that they've spent the last two years trying to not make the company the heel in the eyes of the fans, I would, uh, I would recommend not intimating the story that the company might screw over the fans. Uh, but, uh, and I would just have Cody win, but yeah, you could have punk win or Gunther win, whoever is going to end up wrestling Seth. The only thing is like, obviously Seth's hurt. Um, and we'll be out for a while. Certainly seems like they think he'll be back for mania because they're not stripping him of the title and they're still shooting angles for guys who say they want to wrestle him. So he, he hopes to be back in about a month. Right. So they, so it seems like if Cody is wrestling Roman, which it now seems is still the case at this mania, uh, well, it's got to be punk either winning the chamber or winning the rumble then to face Seth because uh, who else would punk be wrestling if it wasn't Seth? So. Yeah. They, they, they hinted at absolutely nothing else. <laughs> I don't like... think it's true. They did do a segment with him and drew, but CM Punk did not come back to wrestle Drew McIntyre at WrestleMania. No, no, no. The matches are very clearly punk and Rollins. And Roman against either Cody or Dwayne or Cody and Dwayne. Okay. I don't know what else we could add here about the Royal Rumble. There's not a whole lot of intrigue. <laughs> no. Uh, I mean, I guess, yeah, there's not. There doesn't really feel like, again, uh, in light of things, I don't think we're going to see Brock Lesnar as we previously <laughs> spoke about. Uh, I don't know what other... I assume we get some NXT people in in the Rumbles, you know, as far as surprises go. I know X Pac's a name that kind of gets bandied about every year now. Uh, he said he said he's not doing it, but true. But he's a professional wrestler, and they are liars by this, trade. This is also true. So, but yes, to be fair, he is. He has said he's not doing it. So, uh, yeah, I guess that'll be interesting. Who comes back for the women's Rumble, uh, and then. Yeah, the women's rumble, like you said, it's it's very similarly. We pretty much know it's Bailey and Io in some form for the title at Mania, and it's Becky and Rhea for the title at some point and at some form at WrestleMania. So those are your it's one or the other. So yeah, it feels like a coin toss, and it feels like you can get to those destinations no matter who wins or doesn't win. So I guess it's just do you want Cody to be a two-time winner? Do you want to give Punk his first Rumble win ever after all these years? Uh, it's just it's a matter of what they think will, uh, uh, you know, what they, what they want to put in next year's Royal Rumble stat video. Yeah, they've heavily pushed that uh, no one has won back-to-back Rumble since Stone Cold Steve Austin on TV here this last week. So there you go. That seems like a, a fairly safe bet. Uh, Kevin Owens is going to be jumping off that orange at uh, Tropicana Field. We can only assume there's a giant orange on the outfield wall that uh, he'll be jumping off of at some point. And uh, he's there to uh, give Logan Paul a good match, I think. And uh, and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And uh, I think AJ Styles is there to eat a pin in uh, the Roman Reigns match. Yeah, that would uh, that would make sense. They they the first thing they did when AJ came back was him hitting LA Knight. So I'm like, oh, that's probably an undercard WrestleMania match. Him and him and LA Knight. I guess what do you? Uh, I don't know. Orton is maybe the guy that doesn't have an obvious opponent for Mania right now of that group. If they do, if they were to do AJ and LA Knight there, so got to figure out somebody. Maybe it's Drew. Maybe it's somebody else. I'm just not thinking of at the moment. Maybe it's Logan Paul. I don't know. But yeah, maybe he's not uh, figured in. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we, maybe we don't have to figure Randy into every show forever going forward. You think Triple H is not going to book Randy Orton at WrestleMania on two know. nights? <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't. I'm just saying. I think I, we're I'm... getting a long Randy Orton singles match with all the chin locks we've been missing for two years now. That's that's more than fair. That's a, a more than a fair assumption. Um, what else do we have? Uh, Kazuchika... Maybe it's Randy and Omos. Uh, 
they would have a great match. <laughs> it would be awesome. Who are we? Yeah. Who are we kidding here? Yeah. And why I'm not even going to pretend like I don't want to see that. No, that would rule, honestly. Uh, Kazuchika Okada is finishing up with New Japan Pro Wrestling. He had the last match of his contract this week at Corican Hall. He won. <laughs> And then announced that he was vacating the six man tag team title belt that he has. And uh, he is uh, finishing up, even though his contract's up, he's doing three dates next month. One, a singles match with Tanahashi, one final time. Um, and then two, his final two nights, it's a Friday night, uh, Saturday night back to back. And they have not announced what he's doing on those shows yet. But uh, some kind of big farewell for uh, the biggest star in Japanese pro wrestling and uh, over the last decade. And he's coming to North America to wrestle. And it sure seemed like Tony Khan thought he was going to get him last week. And then I don't know what to think today. I still think he would. Tony Khan would probably write Okada a bigger check than WWE would. Mm -hmm. I think if Okada wants to hang out with Nakamura and uh, he's very close with and go fishing and surfing and uh, uh, doesn't mind living in Orlando and his wife doesn't mind living in Orlando, then uh, I think maybe that's more likely. I don't know. I don't know what he's going to do. Yeah, it's. I mean, I feel like at first glance, AEW would be, would be the obvious choice. And obviously, yes, there was something that Tony Khan seemed awfully proud about right around the time that this news broke last week. Um, but to your point, and a lot of people's points, it's like, okay, well, who are the top guys in AEW? Uh that he hasn't worked with. Like he's obviously like Jay White's there. He's not really a top guy, but like Jay White, Kenny Omega, Shibata, like there's a lot of guys there. He's already worked with. Um, I mean, there's a few, like, I mean, the, I just like, I, I can't wrap my head around like Okada and Samoa Joe or Okada and MJF or Okada and Adam Cole. Like I'm just trying to think of like other, other top guys there. Okada and Jericho. I guess they did that once in New Japan, uh, and it wasn't well, very good. No, well, he can. I mean, he can go there. As far as like the best place to go for him to just have matches, obviously AEW is the place. Sure. If he wants to be a global star and hang out with one of his oldest closest friends, then he's gonna go the other place. Like, you know, I, if he wants to live in Japan. He goes to AEW, mm -hmm. and I don't know how they figure out how he's going to do that flight every week. <laughs> uh, that's tough, man. That's why, That's another thing where it's like, I, we, I said for two months on the show, the most likely scenario was him being paid by both New Japan and Tony Khan just because he could still live in Japan and he could come over for eight dates a year or whatever for Tony Khan and everybody would ha everybody would win and everybody would be happy but Will Ospreay is finishing up with New Japan mm -hmm. in a few weeks here and Okada is finishing up with New Japan in a few weeks here so it doesn't seem like the um doesn't seem like Tony wants you to work for New Japan and for him like he, I'm not saying he's anti New Japan obviously he has sure. a working relationship with the company and they do a joint pay per view every together every year. I'm just saying that clearly he wants his company to be the priority if he's writing you a giant check, mm -hmm. and that's his prerogative. Yeah, it's just I, 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 I at this point, I'm leaning fifty one forty nine uh, that uh, Okada's moving to Orlando, but I don't. Know. <laughs> Anybody who says they know isn't telling the truth, by the way, unless it's Tony Khan. Yeah, I would I would I would say that's true. I think obviously there are people American folks who Okada <laughs> knows who speak to the wrestling media who I'm sure have book themselves on podcasts every 3 weeks. Uh-huh. And I'm sure they have opinions 
of where he should or shouldn't go and where he might go and where he would be the most successful in going. But yes, I, I, I don't think he has told anyone for sure. Uh, so we will, we will see. It's, it's obviously, it's a massive deal. He spent the last year beating every young guy who's on the come up in that company. <laughs> it's very funny, um, which was also very funny because there was like the, the day after the story broke, it broke as a, uh, as listeners will know, uh, literally <laughs> minutes after we finished recording last week yeah. on, uh, on Thursday evening, a classic a cla- Yeah. That used to happen to us all the time and hadn't in a while, but it was a good throwback. And, uh, And like the next day there was like a, well, sources in new Japan say that while uh, this is a tough blow, it wasn't unexpected. And I was like, so you expected him to leave and you just had him beat everyone in your company for a year. Anyway, that's interesting with the exception of Naito in the G1 finals last year. (laughs) Right. That's his one. (laughs) uh, That's his one, uh, one job that he did. Right. He put over those 40 year old already made guy. (laughs) Yes. Right. And uh, you expected him to leave, even though you then had to uh, drastically change and rework the the rest of his tour that you just announced Mm -hmm. as soon as he gave notice. Yeah. We were several dates that he was previously announced for. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, No, that's not true. Yeah, that's that's a lie. (laughs) So that's that's what we call in the business a lie. Um, So I do agree it. There are reasons for him to go to both places that make sense. Uh, I think a little part of my soul would die if he went to, if I see him in NXT. (laughs) I don't think he would go there, but a little part of me would die if he did. Uh, And then, yeah, eventually he could, he could be a big star on the main roster. There was obviously a lot of talk at the end of last year about how hard, Paul Levesque and Nick Khan are working to sort of, uh, you know, change the perception that a a Japanese star or a foreign, maybe non-native English speaking star can't, you know, can't be a star, can't be a top guy in WWE. So, well, this would be a big feather in their cap and a big chance to prove that that's the case. Um, but uh, but we'll see. I I think uh, nothing nothing is for sure obviously with uh, with Okada right now. Uh, in in uh, wrapping up here, we've gotten a long time and we've talked about a lot of unpleasant things. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So maybe we can find some common ground here uh, on AEW Dynamite, uh, mm-hmm. which is not often the case. <laughs> but uh, this was a show this week that was headlined by Adam Copeland versus Minoru Suzuki. Mm-hmm. What? <laughs> Excuse me. Speaking of a guy just randomly getting on a flight from Japan to uh to make a town Savannah, Korea. Georgia. Yes, in front of like eleven hundred people or whatever. Two thousand allegedly. Okay. Sure. Allegedly, sure. <laughs> Suzuki and Copeland. I thought they had a fun little skit. <laughs> A wonderful little variety uh, uh, <laughs> half hour there. It look, it was fine. Like I, I was really trying to hate it in the first half. And then they did like some crowd brawling that I didn't think was any good. And then they got back in the ring and just started hitting each other and forearming and slapping each other. Sure. And then I thought it was good. And then I thought that was good. Suzuki didn't know how to take any of edge's offense, which was funny. And unprettier and like uh, the implant DDT. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of funny. So the kind of the finish was a little awkward, but yes, overall it was fine. Um, Adam is uh, he's doing the, uh, the John Cena open challenge. Um, yeah. And uh, he's wrestling a bunch of young guys. And then also Suzuki now uh, it's fine. <laughs> He's having fine matches with several young fellas and Minoru Suzuki uh, on on his way to a rematch. I assume at the show I have built, I have bought tickets for, as mentioned last week, that Revolution show at the beginning of March. Uh, I assume there's another Edge and uh, Edge and Christian match on that show. Um, if they do another step, it'll be fine. <laughs> I don't need a wrestling match between these guys ever again, but. 
they had a perfectly fine entertaining hardcore brawl at the last show so they could do that again yeah uh swerve and uh hanger are the uh, top two contenders for smojo's title and uh they're going to be uh picking each other's matches and opponents next week i don't know i don't very mid 2000s wwe step <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah like it's it's not the it's not the worst idea I've heard this week. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Um, I this is, I was thinking. I think they did one other world title three way several years ago. Um, that was like I think it was Orange Cassidy, Pac, and Kenny. And that's I, the only I've, one I, <laughs> I've forgotten about that. But yeah, it was very thrown together because I think they forgot to book Kenny an opponent <laughs> <laughs> on uh, on that show. But it, they did do that. That's the only time I can remember them doing a three-way for the world title. Uh, but it sure feels like we're getting a three-way here because otherwise either Swerve or Hangman have to wrestle. They have to wrestle each other on TV and one has to pin the other. And it doesn't really feel like it's time yet for another singles match between those two guys. So doing a three-way would continue kick that can down the road and then also... Uh, avoid having to do that singles match for you know until Vegas or or whenever they're whenever they decide they want to do the singles match again. I I guess I mean I also think if we're getting a three way. I just I don't think there's anything wrong with Swerve beating Hangman again on TV before we get there. I mean I get I understand why you don't want to do that because the other person. You still want to keep the other person a viable challenger somewhere down the road, but right. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's uh, ways to do that. I mean, famously, Kenny, <laughs> Kenny and his team pinned uh, pin Hangman like two months before he won the world title from Kenny. So it's not like you can't build a guy back up after after he loses. Yeah, and it's also fake, and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> uh, <laughs> hey, the rankings are back. We've, uh, that's the, a beautiful transition by you. Uh, <laughs> speaking of it being fake and you can do whatever you want, <laughs> Tony Khan has decided to introduce data and statistics back into his booking. Hell yeah. <laughs> the rankings are back and people on television are talking about rankings and moving up and down the rankings and beating someone so they fall out of the rankings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, it's, I, I don't care for it. <laughs> In principle, I like it because you have to theoretically show your work. Sure. Of why yeah. someone is getting a title shot. Yes. Or, uh, you know, why they're in contention for one belt over another or why this guy's getting a shot and not this guy. And theoretically, it means you have to plan things out for a while. Yes. In advance. These are good things, theoretically. Yeah. Now, sure. the last time we had rankings, they got a little bit silly. <laughs> and as someone pointed out, it was like FTR was the number one ranked tag team for like 12 weeks before yeah. the rankings went away and just never got a title shot. And it was never explained why they weren't getting a title shot. So you do have to like, there is potential for this to devolve right back into what it was before they got rid of the rankings the first time. But in principle, I I like the idea of of it. And also it gives you a reason, a built in reason to have a bunch of good wrestling matches on your show every week. And you don't have to create a soap opera melodrama necessarily for it to create a reason why these guys are wrestling the wrestling, because if they win, they move up and they move up the rankings and then they can get a title shot. Maybe you should like, define it better like three to five like three wins equals tnt title shot five wins equals international etc like maybe right. you need to get more specific of like how many wins in a row or the strength of your opponent how that like that's the thing this is the part where you get into the weird minutia that doesn't make sense because it's a fake sport right <laughs> but yes. Uh, yes again in principle i think it's i think it's the show was better when they had the rankings, <laughs> though I don't think it was better because of the rankings. I, don't, I think this is more correlation than causation. 
Um, Eugene Nagata is wrestling Brian Danielson on Collision on Saturday, on Collision on Saturday. <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, oh, he's going to wrestle a real Triple Crown champion, not that fraud Eddie Kingston. So that's uh, that's fun. And they'll they'll chop each other. It's a shame that, like, 90,000 people are going to be watching that show because it's going head to head with the Royal Rumble. But, you know, that's what DVRs are for. Sure. Uh, I will be watching that show on DVR much, much later. Uh, Serena Deeb is also returning on Collision. Thank, thank goodness. Her uh, her first match in uh, like 13, 15 months, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, she's back calling herself uh, the woman of a thousand holds. Meanwhile, uh, Deanna Perrazzo is calling herself the greatest technical wrestler in the world mm-hmm. uh, in her feud with timeless Tony Storm, who has a new action figure out <laughs> as well. <laughs> and uh, the same problems with the Tony Storm gimmick are still there in that it is a hilarious comedy babyface gimmick. And she is a heel champion wrestler, I think. Yes, it's which was really evident when Diana, who the crowds like, but are not sure. as familiar with as they are with Tony. Yes, uh, kind of like she's she's the promo that they did on on Wednesday is all about Diana, you know, calling back to their history. They you know they slept on dojo floors in Japan together. They loved grappling. They're serious wrestlers. Yes. And the uh, and you they know, got matching that, they got matching tattoos. <laughs> that's right. And and that's the Tony Storm I want to face. She's like, I don't want to face this this weird movie star. And then everyone's like, the crowd is like, well, actually, we like the <laughs> we like her when she's like a weird movie star, actually. And <laughs> yeah, so it, like it got kind of an awkward. It didn't get like a big pop when she hits the line about I want to wrestle the real Tony Storm, not this wacky character, because people like the wacky character. Yes. <laughs> uh, wrestling fans love shtick more than they love wrestling most of the time. So yeah. uh, that is a problem. But again, uh, you don't have to be the world champion to be the most pushed character on the show. So you could always have Diana or someone beat Tony for the belt. Let them go off and be a serious wrestler with the belt. And uh, in the meantime, let Tony continue doing her, again, very entertaining most weeks uh, shtick. Yes. Um, hodgepodge here and there as we wrap up. Kevin Patrick is gone. Uh, Rover, the announcer <laughs> on uh, WWE SmackDown, the Irish fellow who is uh-huh. constantly out of breath. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Who was allegedly a soccer announcer of some repute, mm-hmm. um, like called remember, MLS or something. I was gonna say I remember it being like a mildly big deal when he showed up on WWE, like because he was originally like the the Raw post show guy, yes, <laughs> or whatever. And people were like, oh wow, this is like an actual proper sports broadcaster they got. Um, and people seem to like him as the the backstage guy, but not so much the. Uh, he was not good. I don't know of too many people that have been good in this job. Yes, in WWE over the last uh, you know thirty years. Correct. <laughs> but he was he was not good in a way that was noticeable. Um. So feel bad for him because I don't know who could succeed in that symbol. They just <laughs> want because they always just end up going back to Michael Cole because they want my they want another Michael Cole. <laughs> Literally, yes. they would clone it, him. Yes, you know, in perpetuity, percent. if they yes. could. Um, uh, but nobody can quite do it. That's why you had Tom Phillips. That's why you have what's his name that works with Booker T in NXT. Uh, that's why you have like that's why there's always a parade of guys coming in that could theoretically do a job. Someone even argue they do a good job, um, but they're not Michael Cole. <laughs> And so they always fail the system that is designed for the only person who has <laughs> succeeded as a play-by-play commentator in the system over the last 30 years is Michael Cole. And therefore they always end up going back to Michael Cole calling both shows. <laughs> it's, it's really the damnedest thing. And it's like, who's the, uh, who's the guy who's uh, uh, in charge of the announcer or oversees the supervises 
supervises the announce team, whatever, it's uh, it's Michael Cole. <laughs> <laughs> like when Dick Cheney named himself uh, George Bush's vice president. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, I am the best man for this job. <laughs> I legitimately think that Cole actually tried with with uh, with both Jimmy Smith and this guy, though. Yeah, I don't I didn't think I thought Jimmy Smith was all right. And I, th- I thought he was fine. Yeah. Kept, like I said, don't think Kevin Patrick was any good, but he wasn't like noticeably worse than the NXT guy or mm-hmm. in my opinion, I don't watch mm-hmm. as much NXT as you do. So I will defer to your expertise. But uh or there, or some of those other coal clones that have come through in the last couple of years. That's fine. It's like like process of elimination. You would think that the NXT guy, Vic Joseph, is going to get the SmackDown gig just based on process of elimination and literally being the only other person there doing play by play right now. He's no good. <laughs> <laughs> He's really no good. Mm-hmm. He, he, he and Booker T are an all time terrible commentary team. <laughs> And like, Very funny in sound bites because of how yes checked out Booker is and how percent lame Vic is yes but no good when you have to watch a full show no no it's just it's fake enthusiasm and whatever like I, why they fired Tom Phillips I'll never know <laughs> like he's the cl- he probably the cl- <laughs> well. Alleged. <laughs> um, there's also uh he uh but he is probably the closest they've come to cloning Michael Cole. Mm-hmm. I don't know, they don't have the same voice, so that's a difficult but as far as being smooth and uh, not being very good at calling moves, but keeping a WWE broadcast moving along, mm-hmm. he was he was up there. Yeah, but I will say Kevin Patrick was so bad on this past Friday SmackDown, it was like this is the least surprising news I've ever heard. When I heard that he was uh, out, <laughs> it's like, well, well he's in trouble when, like, when Paul's leaking it to Mike Johnson that he <laughs> that Kevin's on the chopping block like two weeks ago. You're like, wow, if WWE is leaking this, they want it out there <laughs> that he is that yeah. his job is in danger. Yeah, he he had a couple of weeks to get real good, and uh, he didn't get real good in a couple of weeks. He did so. shout "Yeah" really loud when, <laughs> when Randy Orton made his miraculous recovery on SmackDown a couple of weeks ago. That's yeah, funny. Uh, poor guy. Anyway, he'll land on his feet. I'm sure he'll call soccer again. Yeah, soccer where you just you just say the last name of the person making the pass, and then the name of the last person receive the last name of the person receiving the pass. And then occasionally uh, you loudly say the name of a person taking a shot and then shout goal if they if it goes in. I think soccer is a very easy sport to call, uh, except I think there's like a, a couple a couple of people that are really good at it, including JP Digital Camera, who is in the uh, uh, U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame now. He somehow has managed to stand out in what is usually just a sport where you just say the name of the person making the pass and the person receiving the pass. <laughs> These are my soccer announcing thoughts. I'm glad everyone's Thank tuned you. in. I'm glad everyone's tuned in. Glad we and got sh- that in before the, <laughs> before the bell. Yeah. I'm glad that was, uh, I'm sure that's a really good use of your time. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I will uh, be seeing you this weekend for your uh, birthday. Mm-hmm. A fun taco party. <laughs> that's what they're telling me. Here's a fun thing. So I was asked, um, do you want to do something for your birthday? And I was like, yes, but I don't want to plan any of it. And then All right. I was told we're doing tacos. So Yeah, um, you were told we're going to have a fun taco party. That's right. And and so we shall. And so it shall be. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday, if you're in the neighborhood, by the way. <laughs> of uh, course. <laughs> well... Uh, so, uh, happy birthday, pal, early, and uh, I'll see you this weekend, and everybody else, happy birthday to you as well, and they will not see you this weekend, and, uh, go Ravens. And, uh, until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. And we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Who 
would be much funnier if I was intentionally doing a bit, but I, uh, <laughs> no, I just happen to have my Zoom background set as the Fraser uh, radio set. <laughs> sure. Like one does. <laughs> well, when you're having a meeting, trying to pitch someone on doing a Fraser podcast with you, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> trying to do a bit, <laughs> I thought it might help. Turns mm-hmm. out it didn't. Well, <laughs> we live, we learn. Yay, 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 yay. I realized today um, that I had been driving for a month uh, with expired tags. Oh, great. Um, I mean, no, I didn't for legal reasons. But uh, right. I had, well, the funny part is like I got the sticker, like I renewed. Right. But then I just like I opened it in like probably the first week of December. And I want to say it was raining the night I opened it or something. So I was just like, yeah, I'll just do it tomorrow. For sure. And then I j- it just sat in a pile of books and and video games and stuff on my on my table here. And then I was like at a stoplight today. And for whatever reason, the sticker, the little sticker on the car in front of me just really caught my eye. I'm staring <laughs> at it. And I was like, this seems significant for some reason (laughs) why is my brain trying to make a connection and then i went oh no (laughs) it's the end of january now (laughs) that's unpleasant but uh you know i my crime spree concluded when i returned home and applied the sticker uh but uh yeah i would say just uh just one of those things just (laughs) Well, accidental crime guy. <laughs> I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that's over. I try to keep on keeping on.